the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services. Common sense internet marketing and web design. Our internet marketing commissions are based on results. Robinson and Mackle, thinking business, practicing law. Heritage Farm Museum and Village. Experience the past, appreciate today, dream for the future. The Appalachian area is comprised of 13 eastern states covering 205,000 square miles of rugged, mountainous terrain. It stretches from New York to Mississippi, with West Virginia being the only state totally encased in the area. When this region was first settled, the immigrants had to travel over the Appalachian mountain range with only what they could carry or haul by wagons. They would make furniture and other wooden items that were necessary and functional. on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, you will see how to construct a Bible box. Appalachian farm families depended on each other to carry out the daily chores. From young to old, everyone had a task to do. There were gardens to tend to, livestock to care for, milking the family cow, cooking, cleaning, sewing, and many more jobs that were divided between young and old. At the end of the day, all would gather around the hearth to talk about their day and read from the family Bible. In 1893, evangelist, author, and songwriter M. B. Williams penned the lyrics to My Mother's Bible. Well-known musician Charles D. Tillman created the tune. There's a dear and precious book, though it's worn and faded now which recalls the happy days of long ago. When I stood at mother's knee with her hand upon my brow, and I heard her voice in gentle tones and low. Blessed book, precious book, on thy dear old tear-stained leaves I love to look. Thou art sweeter every day as I walk the narrow way that leads at last to that bright home above. Well, those days are past and gone, but their memory lingers still, and the dear old book each day has been my guide. And I seek to do his will as my mother taught me then, and ever in my heart his words abide. Blessed book, precious book, on thy dear old tear-stained leaves I love to look. Thou art sweeter every day as I walk the narrow way that leads at last to that bright home above. And today we're here at the West Virginia Farm Museum in Mason County, West Virginia. Uh, today we're discussing the family Bible and the Bible box. Uh, I have my brother Gary Vance here today and he brought the family Bible. Gary, it's my understanding a Bible was used for more than just reading. It was used to record different uh, family events. Yes, yes. Our granddad never talked about his family. No, he wouldn't. I asked him numerous times and he yeah, wouldn't speak. And so I ended up going through various different websites and what have you mm -hmm. and searching down and I came up with what appeared to be a pretty solid genealogy uh, story, you know. And, and I went back to our mom and dad and, yep. and spoke to them a little bit about it. And it reminded my dad, yeah, your dad, right, that he had the Bible that had been handed down to him. It, See, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, I didn't yep. know this either. But when they presented this to me and asked me to make sure we take care of it, mm -hmm. you know, I, I opened it up and started looking at it. Well, that is old. Yeah, 
And um, remarkably, all the stuff I had tracked down is written right here in handwriting. Wow. Okay. okay. And this um, is our history. There is also several lockets of hair in here. It was common for them to keep hair from a deceased family member yes. and they would put it in the Bible and press it and keep yeah. it as a memento. But it just, it, it, it was amazing to me to lay hands on this and, yeah. and see our entire history. Yeah. I noticed the pencil here is several different writings and, and the lead is different so it was not all written at the same no. time. And there's several pages of information that's been right. added in here. Uh, I noticed it has a unique cover on it. Looks like that's yes. a homemade cover. Yeah, it's had a cover put on it because it's pretty worn and tattered. Well, Gary, I want to let you know that I have built a Bible box for you to keep this Bible in now. So uh, it, it'll stay in better shape. So Thank you. Come on back to the Appalachian Heritage Wood Shop, and I'll show you how I built it. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery. In woodworking, you need to know how to safely use your equipment. When creating dust, make certain you have good cross ventilation, a dust collection system, or a dust respirator. If you're applying a finish, please use a NIOSH approved respirator for that particular chemical. A good set of hearing protection is necessary to protect your hearing. And of course, eye protection is a must. I have some rough 10 quarter walnut. It's about seven or eight inches wide. I'll be resawing that. And I have some six by six spalted maple, which I'll be resawing. And then back here, I've got an eight foot long one by 12 walnut. I harvested this from a uh, log from a local farmer. Now, my rendition of a Bible box is a little bit different than most of the ones you see. I use a frame and panel lid, and I like for the lid to be inset, and I like for it to be contrasting. Also, the hinges that I have, I use a wooden hinge with a little metal pin. I think that adds a lot to the uh, design feature of this piece. And if you notice, the bottom is book matched. The corners on this one are hand cut dovetails. There's one thing unusual about this. The dovetails, the tails are on the side instead of the front and the front is the pin board. <laughs> the reason for that is because the pivoting pin here needs to go in long grain and not end grain. If I had the pins on the end board, then this pin would be going into end grain and it would not be very strong, it would not last very long. So, first thing I wanna do is resaw the maple and the walnut. Before I resaw it, I like to have the edge that is on the table of the bandsaw and the face that is against the fence on the bandsaw, I like for that to be perfectly flat and perpendicular. So I need to take these over to the joiner before I go to the bandsaw. When using a joiner, make certain you don't have any loose clothing or jewelry that can get caught in the machinery. Apply a slight downward pressure and a slight pressure towards the fence. Resawing, a slow, steady feed rate is best with slight pressure towards the fence. That way you'll get a consistent thickness throughout the resaw. Now I need to run them through my planer. cut, if you notice I have an X, which is where the waste is, I need to cut on the waste side of this line. You want to cut
cut down to the line, not beyond. Now the way I prefer to do this, I prefer to feel the line instead of see the line. So I'll drop my chisel on the board and drag it back until I feel it drop down into that little scratch mark and then just tap it just enough to pronounce the line a little bit. I want to create a little trough for the fibers to go to so I don't end up. So now I've got a shoulder I can rest my chisel against. When I'm holding a chisel, I'm holding it down, but I'm also pushing back just slightly and I'm going to take out just a little bit. Now I can use a little bit more force and take out a bigger piece this way. And I only go halfway. So I'm done with that one. So now I'll do the same thing on the other side. You've got to get the right corners to match up and that's the reason for numbering them. So there's my dovetail box fit together. Now what I need to do is clean it up, glue it up, and clamp it. So now I need to set my miter gauge at 45 degrees so I can cut the miters for the lid. Now I've got a stop set up so I can cut the boards to the exact length. Got the dado blade set in the table saw. Got the fence set up. So now, by taking two passes, the groove will be perfectly centered. Now I need to cut the panel to the exact width. I need to make certain that the center glue line is in the center of the board. So I need to measure from the center out to get the correct width. Okay, now I've sanded the panel and I've rounded over the inside edge of the frame. So now I'm ready to glue this together. I'm going to use some brown glue, but before I put any glue anywhere, I want to take a little bit of wax. I've already rounded over the corners. So I want to take a little bit of wax and put just on the edge, especially the rounded over corners. What this does, if there's any glue squeeze out, it will come in and get on the panel the wax will keep it from sticking so it can still float. Taking my time to get the right amount of glue on there, I don't want to get too much because if I have any glue squeeze out, it can come in and get on the panel. The miter cut is very similar to a butt cut in that there's a lot of end grain. So by itself, this is not real, real strong. But what I will do is put a uh, Line in it to reinforce it. I've got the lid fully assembled, it's glued up. Now what I want to do is reinforce this miter joint with an exposed spline. So I've got my jig set up, and I'm going to put this in the cradle and cut a kerf 
and put a spline in the curve. I've taken a scrap piece of birch and cut several small splines. And now what I gotta do is just glue them in the curves that I just cut. And this will reinforce the miter. Now you're probably wondering about the excess that's sticking out. After it dries, I'll trim that off with a flush cut hand saw. And then, uh, plain or sand it flush after that. Now I've got the bottom cut to the proper dimensions. I have not routed the edge on it yet. And the reason it is easier to measure and get the box centered up on the bottom with a sharp, crisp, clean edge. Now I've just finished gluing on the hinges and I made a pivot pin extra long with a bend in it so I can pull it in and out easy. And I want you to notice I had a couple spacers in here. If you don't put spacers in here and you clamp this on there, you won't have clearance for the lid to close. So that's very important. So now you can see just exactly how the lid will work and it gives you clearance back here and the thing that I like about this design is the box has a stop and it stays open about a hundred degrees <laughs> so now I'm ready to assemble and I would rather assemble I would rather assemble the base without the lid, then I'll apply the finish and then reinstall the lid. So this needs to be glued on. And as you can see, what I've got are what's called a blind dowel. I've drilled holes in the base and holes in the bottom of the box. And I will glue these in place and clamp them. I've already done my sanding uh, and I've also rounded over all my sharp edges, so I'm ready to glue this together now. Now the reason I'm using brown glue here is because this is walnut, and it'll blend in a lot easier if I have any squeeze out that I don't get cleaned up. When I put those in, I like to give them a little bit of a twist. Now I'm just gonna apply a bead of glue Here's another little quick tip. If you take a wet rag, go right around the outside. If you have any glue squeeze out, it won't soak into the wood because the wood's already wet. Okay, so now I'm ready to put this on. I'm ready to apply a finish to the Bible box. As you can see, I've taped off the top of the inside. That's because the client wants a liner in here, so I'll be putting a fabric liner in there. And it's easier to get the glue to adhere to bare wood than it is a wood that already has a finish on it. I've installed the um, 
pins and that's to keep the finish from going down into the hole. So when I go to put the lid on, I can epoxy the pins in there. The epoxy will grip the bare wood better. And I've got some uh, items here to keep this propped up off of the wax paper I've got. Uh, there's some store brands, but I've also got some that I got out of a pizza box. These are really handy and they're free. So what I have is an oil varnish blend I'm going to do the bottom first and I like to put it on with a rag and what you want to do is just flood the surface get as much of it on as you can and you can see that it soaks in and the way the grain is it'll soak in some areas more than it will others so you want to keep it wet for a few minutes and let it soak in evenly all the way and then you wipe off the excess. That book matched walnut is really pretty. So now let me just do the rest of the way. This really makes the hand cut dovetail stand out. And of course the end grain soaks it up much faster than the long grain. So I need to make sure I get plenty on there. And now I'm ready to do the lid. And this will really make this spalted maple stand out against the beautiful dark collar of the walnut. And that really makes the spline stand out. See where it's soaking into the spalted maple more than it is the walnut. The book match spalted maple really stands out and those zone lines really look good against the walnut. Now I need to let that dry and then I'll come back and give it a second coat. You need to be very careful with how you dispose of your rags. Uh, any rag that is used with an oil-based uh, finish, uh, you have the opportunity for spontaneous combustion. Okay, now I'm ready to install the hinges on the Bible box. You can see I've already installed the liner. So now I need to pull out my temporary pins. And I'm ready to install my permanent pins. And these are already sized. What I'm going to do is mix up a little bit of epoxy, two-part epoxy. This is a five-minute epoxy, so it doesn't take it very long to set up. And before I put the epoxy in the hole, I need to take a little bit of sandpaper and roughen up the edge of the brass pin. That'll give the epoxy something to grip a hold of. Now I want to put just a little bit down inside the hole. It doesn't take very much. And you need to be careful. Try not to get this on the wood any. If you do, you'll have to wipe it up because you need to make sure that the hinge can pivot. Now when I install the pin, it is going to displace some of the epoxy. Some of that epoxy will uh, ooze out. So I'm going to use a little spacer, which will help me to keep the epoxy from getting onto the wood. And I like to have it where it's flush with the wooden hinge. Now I need to let that set. Although it's five minute epoxy, I like to let it set for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I'll remove a little spacer and then that'll, that'll be it. Thanks for watching the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. For more information on today's product,